I want you to let them know how much you appreciate their work for us. And they're faithful, aren't they? They just don't miss. They're always here. And I really appreciate how faithful that they are. You know, a church will not be much for God without faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Takes faithfulness. And we want to see us continue. If you did not pick up a copy of the latest Sword of the Lord, there's still some out there. Uh, If you've not picked up a copy of the Sword of the Lord, it has a lot of good sermons, Everlasting Arms, Standing Where Giants Have Stood, How to Respond Properly to a Scandalous Allegations, Can We Have Revival, and then 27 Major American Cities Are Abortion Free. That's interesting. Uh, Just pick this up, and there's a lot of other things in there for you. Some things for men and women and young people. It's packed with a lot of things. I picked up my first copy of one of these years ago at Highland Park Baptist Church when Dr. John R. Rice himself was there. And so this has a lot of things uh, that I believe will bless your heart. All right, let's go now, if you will, to the book of Philippians chapter 1. The book of Philippians chapter 1. And uh, read with me, if you will, please, beginning in verse 12, and we'll go down to verse 19. But I would have you understand, brethren, the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing waxing confident by my bonds, so much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, and sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set. Uh, have that word underscored in my Bible. Maybe you'd do that same thing tonight. I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. Once again, Paul's in a dungeon handcuffed to the soldier, big strong soldier, and uh, he's praying that he'll get out. You would too, wouldn't you? If you were in a dungeon and had one meal a day and it was cold and dreary, you'd like to hear you're released. But that that call never came. That that message never came uh, until he was taken out and of course his head was cut off and he went to be with the Lord. And uh, that tells me that Paul meant what he said when he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Question for you. How, and and it could happen, it could happen. I don't know how much God will allow us to suffer before the rapture. Now think about this for a second. Will he come before there's tremendous persecution of the church? We do know that's going to happen. We do know that in the first half of the tribulation period that there's going to be 7,000 Jews saved. They're all going to be men, and they're going to preach all over the earth, and from that preaching, others are going to be saved. Most of them, Bible scholars believe, they'll be killed, uh, and so forth. And so, uh, you you think about that. Think about that. And... um, What would you have going through your mind um, as you are there? Uh, And so when I read these verses, I I, I remember what Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now he didn't just say words, did he? He meant that. He was ready, he was prepared for whatever it was that was coming. Now the devil has some things prepared for you. Did you know that? The devil has some things prepared for me. I believe the scripture tells us very plainly that we're watched all the time by Satan. 
Again, he can only be at one place. He has a place, a seat, the Bible says. Maybe in Jerusalem. I don't know. Washington, I don't know. But he has a seat where he operates from, and he has millions of minions, and you are being watched, and I'm being watched by these demons. They observe how we think, what we say, where we go, what we listen to, what we watch. Why? To see if they can find a crack where they can get into our armor. He may use depression. If a Christian is given to being down and discouraged. Through the years of my ministry, I've dealt with all kinds of people. And one of the things that the devil has used in the congregations that I have pastored is depression in the lives of the members of the church. Depression. Many given to depression. Men and women. And so Satan will use that. Uh, There's a lot of men hooked on pornography and that kind of thing. Satan detects that. And will always place in front of them these kind of things. So we're being watched, and he knew that, and he understood that, and he also stood that uh, one of these days that he would go and he would be with the Lord, and so he wanted to be faithful. Now the verses that I just read to you, there's so much here. One of the members of our church always saying something like this to me. You, you've been in John, you've been in Philippians, so... So it's the scripture. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I may repeat sometimes, but did you know repetition is the way you learn? Did you know that? When I was in Bible college and when I was in, in college studying to, for psychology and that kind of thing, our professor would repeat. So we'd get it. I want you to get it, he'd say. And Dr. Robertson would do the same thing. But I don't want to just to, to wear you out, but I want you to get it. Persecution might come sooner than we think it will. So what will we do? Will we be ready for it when it comes? Now, beginning in verse 12 here and down to verse 19, you have the marks of a mature witness. The marks of a mature witness. Uh, Then you go down to verse 30, or verse, I'm sorry, verse 20, you have the marks of a great Christian believer. The marks of a great Christian believer. So, could I look at myself and say, here are the marks of a mature witness? Am I a mark? Do I have the marks of a mature witness? Do I have the marks of a Christian believer? And then you begin in verse 27 down to verse 30, and you have the marks of a great Christian church. So, here in chapter 1, verse 12, and by the way, back up in uh, in uh, verse 1, you have the marks of a healthy church. We discussed that. Uh, down in verse 3 and on, you have the marks of a mature believer. And so here are the things that characterize a believer. And one of the things that should characterize us that we have the marks of a mature witness. Now, Brother Billy's not in here. He's out, out there. But he and... Uh, uh, Let's see, what is his name? (laughs) Keith. They went visiting yesterday, and I think Keith went on one side and uh, Billy went on the other side and uh, so forth, and so, or maybe together, and they visited a house right across from where Mark lives. And I went and visited them Thursday night, but they weren't at home. So they went yesterday, and they said, well, we can't come tomorrow, but we'll come next Sunday. Visiting pays. Inviting people to church pays. When are we going to get that, see? Always visit. I, I carry our, our tracks in my pocket all the time. And when I go to the store or the gas station or wherever it is, I'm giving these things out, inviting people uh, to church. Sue and I rushed over to Arby's today uh, for a little something to eat. And every time we go in there, I'll hand a card and I'll say, I want to invite you uh, to our church and so forth. Well, many of them don't come, but I've had some to come. Amen. And so let's always be ready. So now in, uh, uh, in chapter 1, verse 12, as we was talking about here now, the marks of a mature believer. What are those marks? First of all, he shares the gospel gladness of circumstances. Did you get that? He shares the gospel greatness of circumstances. Now watch what he says in verse 12. 
But I would that you should understand, brethren, the things which happen unto me. Things are going to happen to you. Events are going to happen to you. You're going to be taken by surprise. You're walking along and you never expect this to happen and bang, it hits you right in the face. Right in the face. I was, I was visiting, I went by myself uh, Saturday and I had some visit, I had to drive around to get to some of them and I stopped uh, to get uh, some things on the way back and was going to get in my car and the phone rang and it was one of the men here and said, you need to get back to the church as quick as you can. I said, what's going on? Just you need to get back as quick as you can. And so I got in the car and came down and there was a man riding a motorcycle and he was talking to the men back in the gym uh, and uh, he had a place to stay but he needed food and some other things and so I took him into the office and talked to him about being born again and one of the men gave him some money for gas and then we gave him some food and that kind of thing. I didn't know that was going to happen yesterday. I, I didn't know that was going to happen but it happened and I had an opportunity to share the gospel with this man. Now he said he was saved and I went over that but things are going to happen to you and we need to be ready for them. Now I think that what makes, made Paul's life different from ours is this. How can I use this event in my life to honor Christ? We don't look at it like that all the time, do we? I'll have to admit, I don't. I don't. I wish I did all the time. But I want to be aware of that. And so Paul's thinking was this. I didn't expect this, but how can I use this to advance the cause of Christ? How can I use this to have an opportunity of preaching the gospel? Now, he told the believers, he said, I want to come to you so I can impart unto you some spiritual gift. Uh, he said, I want to come to you and I want to be a witness where you are. And he was always saying, I want to be a witness, I want to be a witness, I want to be a witness. Do you think it ever entered in his, into his mind that being in prison would open up great opportunities for witnessing? Uh... By the way, you do know that even today Christians are being arrested falsely even today. Remember some four or five years ago, the pastor up in Canada? They arrested him because he was preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. And they arrested him in Canada and put him in jail. From what I understand about the man, he had this attitude. I'll use this to preach the gospel. And man... That's what happened. When they interviewed him, man, he preached the gospel and he got free publicity on him and his church. You never know what God's going to do and how God's going to use circumstances to get his word out. Uh, when I was in, in my first year at Tennessee Temple, I was just making friends. Just making friends. And... I got in class, it was an Old Testament survey, first class, Old Testament survey. Uh, Dr. Wyma Porter was the professor, and I had heard that he was one of the best, and he was. And so I'm setting up, and I hear a commotion in the back, and I look in the back, and there's some young men helping this, um, he was 20 years old, 20 years old, and he was that high, about that high had crutches, he had had polio, and had the, on the legs and on the knees and those kind of things. And he was walking in like that. And his name was Gary French. Well, I found out that he was a kidder. And so I'm a kidder too, and so we got to be best friends kidding other people. And kidding with one another. You know what he told me as we were talking one day? He said, I want to be an evangelist. And you know what I did? Ha, ha, ha. You're that tall, and you're going to be an evangelist? Well, he was, and he still is, and he's still preaching, and he's got those canes like, like, like that, and that's the way he gets around, but he has a voice. What happened? Well, the things that happened to him, God allowed for the furtherance of 
the gospel. Now, I've got to admit that sometimes the things that happen to me, I say, Lord, why? You never do that, do you? You never do that. You, you, you just say, like Brother Bo's wife back there, Lord Jesus, I'm so happy about this. I haven't taken a shot at her lately. I thought I had to do that. Uh, sometimes things just happen, don't they? And we may think this is awful, terrible, but it might be for the furtherance of the gospel. And so he says in verse 12, But I would not that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. And so he shares the gospel regardless of circumstances. He shares the gospel regardless of circumstances. So these dark consequences, he was in prison in Rome, but the Lord used it for the furtherance of the gospel. I look at Christianity today, and I want you to, I'm going to ask you this question. You answer it yourself, okay? How many real witnesses for Jesus do you know? How many real witnesses for Jesus do you know? I mean, they've got their Bible in their car, their New Testament in their car, or in their pocket. They've always got tracks in their pocket, and they're always looking for a little space of time, a little opportunity, just to do any kind of witnessing, and they take advantage of that. We need that. Our church needs that. If we're going to grow, we need that. Now, we've had a, a you want to call it a soul winning course or a witnessing course. We've had that before uh, with Brother Hamilton. And I said something this morning about we probably will have another one in September, but this will not be with some one coming in. Uh, we'll do it on the screen. But I've looked at the program. It's a very good program, and I believe it would really help us uh, to, to go out and to do that and spend a whole month uh, in doing that. So here are these dark circumstances, and the Lord used them in the life of the Apostle Paul. First of all, he witnessed to the elite guard. Now, we talked about that the last time. He witnessed to the elite guard. Well, what else could he do? They're chained together. And the guards got to listen to him. He had a chained audience. Didn't he? And so he used that opportunity. What would I have done if that was me? Woe is me. I've been so faithful. I, I've wanted to serve the Lord, and now here I am chained to this guard. I might want to use other choice words. You know, we Christians sometimes better, you know, we, we laugh and say we wouldn't do that. Sometimes we might. Just think about it now. Or blame the Lord. And get all upset. But that was not what Paul did. And uh, we find out from this passage of Scripture that many of the family, the guard himself, his family, and members of his family, and people in the palace were getting saved because Paul led these men, these big, burly, strong men to the Lord. Remember what I said to you the last time? They had to have served the king, the emperor, for 12 years at least. They had to have been at least, in at least 12 major battles and survived it. They were tough. Probably really mean too. But God used the little old short, bald, Apostle Paul to win many of them to the Lord. They went back to the palace, led their family. Their family in turn led others to the Lord. We need to get back to that. Let's get back to that here. Let's, let's start witnessing to our family, our friends and seeing people come into our church, and seeing them born again. But now not only that, people were being encouraged. His witnesses, witnessing was encouraging other believers. But I would, uh, that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. <clears throat> Verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest 
in all the palace and in all other places. His witness for the Lord went in places he could have never gotten into on the outside. Do you see that? His circumstances <clears throat> put him in a place of witness that he could have never gotten, in, gotten into. He could have never, it had never happened to him on the outside. But being chained, God used that. And can, can you imagine? Think with me for just a moment now. I, I really don't know how the judgment seat of Christ is going to be. Uh, the Bible says we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things we've done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And I don't know how all that will take place. It could take place in just a moment of time. God could do that in a moment of time. It may be done differently. But let's just say that we're there and Paul comes up before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> Can you imagine and the Lord says to him, well done. Well done. I lay in bed at night and I think. When, uh, when the disciples went home to be with the Lord, remember John leaned on the breast of Jesus? Remember that? How close they were? And Peter, how close they were? Now, here's what, here's what I think about. When Peter went to heaven, and Paul went to heaven, and there, there's the Savior, in a body, in a body, <laughs> what do you think happened when they met one another? I think about that, and I get so thrilled. That's the way I want it to be for me. I fail again and again and again, and so do you. But aren't you glad he'll forgive and say, keep on going, keep on going. That day's coming. That day's coming. I say it again and again and again. Jesus said, Peter said, Lord, we've left everything. What are we going to have? And Jesus said, Peter, no man has left everything for my kingdom that will not be, re not be rewarded, but will be rewarded fourfold, a hundredfold again and again and again, for witnessing for me and the gospel. That's pretty good payment, isn't it? That is pretty good payment. God's not, have you got this? God's not an Indian giver. He loves to lavish on His children. He loves it. And He's done more for me than I deserve, and I think you would say the same thing. But now watch. His witnesses, witnessing encouraged others. Is my witnessing encouraging others? Uh, Billy and, and, and Keith uh, and, and Jim when he can and others when they can go out with us visiting. And uh, I, I, went, I went into a, a completely new section yesterday that I'd not been in. And in the two years I've been here, I've knocked on a lot of doors. And I'm not bragging, that's my job. If I don't do that, find you another preacher. Find you another preacher. If, if, you, if I'm not doing that, find some other preacher that will do it. Because I can't preach to you if I don't do it. And I knocked on a lot of doors and nobody came to the door. I've been cussed. Uh, I mean, worse than I've ever been in my ministry. But I'm used to it. I'm a pretty tough customer. And it don't bother me but a little bit, because I want them saved. So, is your witnessing encouraging others uh, to be more effective, to be more of a witness for the Lord? Now, he's, I like what he says here. Uh, he holds no personal jealousy, nor desire for credit, or prestige. Isn't that interesting? Now before he was saved, he lived for recognition and promotion. And he got it, didn't he? I mean, he is at the top. At the top of his game. He hated those Christians. 
Don't you remember the story in Acts 9? He hated Christians. And he had papers going from house to house, hailing men and women, putting them in prison and having them killed, and he loved it. That was the Apostle Paul. That was Saul before he became Paul. Boy, God can change a life, can he? Man, you think about this guy. Loving what he was doing, having people killed. He hated the Lord so much. And by the way, we're seeing that now. Christians are hated now. You know what? And we know what they're doing now. Well, witness, but keep it in the church. Witness, but keep it among your friends. Don't come out here and bother us. And I look for a law to be passed down the road somewhere where you can't witness for your faith publicly or you'll get arrested. You say no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because all of that's leading up to the great tribulation. Seven years of tribulation. I love the book of Revelation. I've talked through it about eight or nine times, and I go back to it, and I still marvel at how much I don't know about it. But my soul, <clears throat> first three and a half years going to be some semblance of a peace, setting up for the Antichrist. And then the midway point in chapter 13, there's an image put up for the whole world to see, and you're going to bow down and take the mark of the beast. And then, the last three and a half years, almost three and a half years, it's the great tribulation. Great tribulation. Thousands are killed. Thousands. And then the armies of the earth. Oh, and by the way, I believe America's in that group. I personally don't think America will be destroyed. I think it will go right into that group, fit right into it. And they'll converse on Jerusalem because they want the oil and they want all of the jewels and all that's over there. And they're going to, Russia and China, and they're going to converge. And then <laughs> the Bible says, <laughs> I love it, there will be the sign of the Son of Man. <laughs> and the Bible says, we'll come with him riding on white horses. Now, I don't know whether that's literal or not. I hope it's not literal because I don't think Keith could ride a horse. I certainly know Reggie wouldn't ride a horse or couldn't ride a horse. I wouldn't want to go, I wouldn't want to be on the horse beside Reggie, let me say that. I couldn't resist that. I had to get on Reggie again tonight because he always gets on me. So I've, I couldn't help that. I'm sorry. And the Bible says, We come with him. Thousands riding on white horses. And instead of conversion on Israel, the Antichrist turns his attention towards the Lord. And I love this. <laughs> we don't do a thing. The Bible says, with the word of his mouth. Just the word of his mouth. And the blood is up to the horse's bridle. It'll take several months to clean all that carnage up. That's the day that God has warned about. The great day of His wrath will come. Do you have a son or a daughter that's not saved? A grandson that's not saved? A mother or a dad that's not saved? Would you want them to go through that? I, shouldn't, I would not want any of my family uh, to go through that. Well, we'll stop there. <clears throat> I said uh, that I'll give these folk a break tonight. And then I saw Reggie come in late, and I said, no, I'm going to keep him here. <laughs> but study this, and we'll try to finish this chapter uh, next week. But let's be much in prayer now for this week and for the, uh, the teens, that they'll have a good time at camp, that they'll learn a lot from the Scriptures, and they'll come back and enjoy a, a great time uh, with the Lord. Pray for Kevin, or, uh, that, that the Lord will be with him and help him. Uh, he's got a tough job. And he wants the best for those kids. He really does. So pray for him. Pray for those that are with him. Let's stand, please, and we'll pray. Ladies, you meet with my wife in here. Men, we'll go in and we'll, we'll end our day uh, in prayer uh, back in the uh, fellowship hall back there. Lord, you're coming again. I'm excited about it. I get so excited sometimes, Father. It just uh, uh, this thrilling to just listen for the trumpet, 
I don't know how it's going to sound. I don't know what it'll sound like. But it's going to sound that in less than one-sixth of a second, we'll be gone and we'll be with you forever. What a thrill. What a thrill. And serve you forever and ever and ever. Help us to be so faithful that we'll hear you say, well done. Bless Journey Baptist Church. Bless every member. Take us from where we are to where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say this before you go. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you so much. Uh, I pretty much know that this crowd will be here and others that would have been here. Uh, one of the things that encourages a preacher more than anything else is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Uh, you may not can sing, you may not can give a whole lot of money, but you can be faithful. Amen? And you are. Thank you so much. All right. Let's uh, pray together. <clears throat>